Hello, my name is Sarah Ann, and today I will be talking about this book, Miranda July's The First Bad Man. It doesn't have a front cover, so this is the back. <laughs> That's Miranda July, I assume. I know. I don't know if I really know, but I'm pretty sure. I don't think she has a twin. All right, so for this recap, um, I typed out what I was going to say, so I'm mostly going to be reading from my notes on my laptop. The First Bad Man by Miranda July. It's a narrative showing the ups and downs and mixed and tangled trajectories of seeking special connections. Having grand ideas of who people are and how they have to do with you, and then losing those ideas, for better and for worse, for what's happened. It's a work drama, like a workplace drama, a romance in several ways, several romances. Um, it's a queer narrative, surprisingly. This just hit me. Um, it's also a parent-child story in several ways that are surprising. Um, it's a really strange and unexpected story um, to me. I know that's relative. So it's full of fun and insightful, um, you know, who knows if they're true or not, um, but fun and insightful bits like, we only reveal that we think we're terrible people before asking someone to love us. So it gets deep, but it's also like, you don't know how reliable uh, or wise the main narrator is. There's only one narrator throughout the book, but you know, you don't really know. Um, she's not, you know, all knowing. She's not, um, you know, supposed to be this omniscient uh, viewer or observer. She's very much in these stories and gleaning wisdom, but these situations are strange and arguably at times um, inappropriate and wrong. And so the wisdom that she takes from these situations, I think could also be understood as faulty. <clears throat> so this main character, her name's Cheryl, one way that she's realistic is that you can question her thoughts and understandings. And um, she doesn't get, uh, I don't know if this is realistic, but she doesn't get caught up in rumination too much. Um, or at least the author doesn't provide much of her existential confusion as if it were, um, you know, like a philosophical uh, existential text. Um, you know, it's not in dry, technical, or academic language. It's very much like, this is what's going on. And it's, I didn't, I don't think I looked up any vocabulary. Um, it was like, you know, a fun, like not challenging in terms of language read. The questioning of reality and appropriate behavior is played out in the questionable decisions that nearly every character makes. Uh, for me, I really started loving and thinking the book Glorious and High Making around page 80. Um, and the book is about 300 pages. It had been interesting and I was enjoying the book before page 80, but that's when I really got hype about it and wanted to share it with others and read it like a lot. You know, that's what I wanted to do with my time. Uh, one of my favorite topics of the book had to do with adult games. So these are, you know, games that aren't child appropriate because they have to do with the pleasures of pain and fear play. And I think that's just like a really interesting concept. Um, uh, this next thing has to do with this and maybe I'll return, but in general, I think novels do this, but this book in particular, I was more aware of how our surroundings can be observed and described and how cultural customs and unspoken dynamics of attraction and repulsion exist. In some ways, the main character seems delusional and unattractive and bad in her way of being, 
but she's really not hurting anyone besides herself, if you want to offer that judgment. The main character, each of her interactions are strange to me, and thus I think I noticed how conversation is full of expectation and value, a currency that's exchanged. Sharing understanding is like an equal trade, whereas feeling misunderstood or becoming deeply confused can feel like you've lost something, time or well-being. So relating this back to this thing about adult games, I think the point is that adults are involved in all of these unspoken coordinations and arrangements and maybe they were spoken at one time and now they are not spoken about anymore. Um, say you make it, you made a promise and then you continue to follow that promise, but the intention and the desire to follow through is no longer there. And so that's kind of an adult game where, you know, you're doing something that, you know, a child might just throw a tantrum or, um, you know, a child might say, this is painful, but, you know, for an adult, I think you do find yourself in situations where, um, you know, you're doing something for pleasure that other people might look at and say that's perverse or that's, um, you know, masochistic and then they'll judge it being masochistic or something. Um, but I just really like that kind of like heightened awareness to um, the strange customs and strange only in the sense that it's not inherent or essential or given to it's not a universal experience even though the what lies beneath it might be more universal like wanting to be loved and you know have you know have a social life or something wanting attention or affection but that the games and the ways that we get our needs met can sometimes be very um unorthodox or unconventional. Overall, I think it's a good book for facing how you might judge people. And one wonderful thing about books is that there aren't jarring or fearful consequences for how you might act upon your judgments. The story plays out without you and your intervention. If you find yourself feeling responsible for something, that's an opportunity to act in the real world, but this story is happening as it's happening without whatever you decide you should or shouldn't do. I like that. It's relieving. So, as I said, I think that's something about novels and just narratives in general. Um, and I mean, from a writing perspective, I think it's interesting because I do a lot of just like journaling and making notes of my own story and what happens in my life. But thinking of fiction and how you can kind of create a cohesion or, you know, like just the characters don't just die like halfway through the book. Um, and I mean, I don't know if that's a fear I have in my everyday life, but there's nothing that I can do to change these last pages of this story. Um, and I think that relief from responsibility um, of like what happens I think some people it might stress them out like I think some people get really stressed out when they read like a really violent thing or um, they read say like Lolita and they start to identify with someone who's like a pedophile um, because that's like written into the story um, so you know it's a it's a wheel it's, it's the wheel of fortune where there's like the up and down of like not having control over what happens next and being invested in what happens next <clears throat> so i've just been going chronologically through the notes that i took while right reading this um my method is just taking notes on pieces of paper i really enjoyed reading this book I liked hearing about these people with very different lives than I, though still plausible. Uh, and thus, perhaps, it was an exercise and expansion in valuing experiences you don't understand. To end, I'm going to read a part from page 36. I think it'll be interesting whether there's context or not, but here's some. Uh, Cheryl, the main character, 
is hosting young woman Klee, another main character, though not the narrator. Um, and Klee, uh, Klee's parents, Carl and Suzanne, are Cheryl's bosses. Um, what I'm going to read starts with Cheryl on the phone with Klee's parents, and I might add some clarification of just who's talking as I read, because it's um, the dialogue has already started at this point. So this is Suzanne speaking. Cheryl! She was back. This is Cheryl speaking. Hi. Sorry about that. I'm not having fun in this marriage right now. Oh no, I said although this was the only way they ever were, like this or loudly entranced by each other. He makes me feel like shit, she said, and then to Carl, well, then go away. I'm having a private conversation here, and I can say what I like. And then to me, how are you? Good. We never thanked you for taking Clee, but it means so much. Her voice became thick and halting. I could see her mascara starting to run. Just to know she's getting exposed to good values. You have to remember she grew up in Ojai. Carl picked up. Please excuse the theatrics, Cheryl. You don't have to listen to this. Feel free to hang up. Fuck you, Carl. I'm trying to make a point. Everyone thinks it's such a terrific idea to move out of the city to raise your kids. Well, don't be surprised when that kid is pro-life and anti-gun control. You should see her friends. Is she going on auditions? I'm not sure. Can you put her on? I wondered if I was still allowed to hang up if I wanted to. She might need to call you back. Cheryl, hun, just put her on. She could tell I was scared of her daughter. I opened my door. Clee was eating ramen on the couch. It's your mom. I held out the phone. Clee took it with a swipe and strode out to the backyard, the door slamming shut behind her. I watched her pacing past the window her mouth a little spitting knot. The whole family exerted tremendously towards each other. They were in the throes of passion all the time. I held my elbows and looked at the floor. There was a bright orange Cheeto on the rug. Next to the Cheeto was an empty Diet Pepsi can, and next to the can was a pair of green lace thong underwear with white stuff on the crotch. And this was just the area right around my feet. I touched my throat, hard as a rock but not yet to the point where I had to spit instead of swallow. Clee stormed in. Someone named, she looked at the screen, Philip Bethlehem called you three times. I called him back from my car. When he asked me how I was, I did my equivalent of bursting into tears. My throat seized, my face crumpled, and I made a noise so high in pitch that it was silent. Then I heard a sob. Philip was crying out loud. Oh no, what is it? He had seemed fine when we touched fingers through the computer. All right, and that's all for now. Um, I very much recommend this book. I thought it was very fun. It's super like weird, and you might feel a little perverse reading it. Um, but I think to acknowledge or just say our desires, which comes up in this book, we might feel a little perverse, so I think it's just comes with the territory of writing something that is um, relatable on different levels. So, um, yeah, I hope you're doing well. Bye. <laughs>